Hello. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Are we good? So check. All right. Um, okay, well, welcome. Um, my name is Penny, and I'm from the Monument Public Library. And today we have Russ Shoemaker coming in to talk to us all about water in Colorado. Uh, louder? Just a little more. Okay, I'll adjust the microphone once they get once they get talking. Um, but before um, Russ comes up, I just want to introduce Hope Bartlett, who is the water converse. Conver how bad I was at saying this word. Conservationist here for the city of Longmont. She's just going to talk to you for a few minutes. Awesome. Thank you so much, Penny. And thanks, everybody, for coming out and spending your Thursday evening with us. I was like, what day actually is it? Um, I am Hope Barlett. I'm the water conservation specialist for the city. I run all of our water conservation programs. And I just wanted to spend a couple minutes with you giving you insights to what kind of programs we have in the city for water conservation. Um, first and foremost, we participate in all of Resource Central's Program. So if you've heard of Resource Central, they're a nonprofit that operates outside of Boulder, and um, they do programs like Garden in a Box, Turf Replacement Program, um, WaterWise Yard Seminars, and our Lawn Replacement Program, which is semi-new. Um, and then we also do rebates and discounts through our partnership with Efficiency Works. Um, so if you do any programs or projects at your home that you want to save water on, say you need a new washing machine, we have a rebate for that. Say you want to tear out your lawn, we have a rebate for that too. So any type of water conservation pro projects that you're doing at home, or if you own a business, we also have programs for your businesses as well. Um, there are flyers out on that back table when you all first walked in about our programs, um, links to our websites, more things like that. Um, there's also an opportunity to sign up for the sustainability newsletter. So um, they have their program out there as well. So if you're interested in any of the sustainability related programs that the city offers, such as waste reduction or air quality, um, they kind of programming as well. Um, and then last but not least, we are hosting a water fair. So um, come on out on June 9th at Dickens Park. We're hosting a water-themed educational science art event for the whole family. Um, and it's going to be really fun and really hands-on, really educational, but also um, drenched in art and creativity. So come on out, bring your friends and family. We'd love to see you there. Um, and so I know you guys are all here to hear Russ talk about water in Colorado and the West. Um, so I want to pass the mic to him, but with one last point, Longmont has a really interesting water supply. And I just am curious if anybody knows where our water here comes from. OK. That's great. Yeah. Yes. Button Rock serves most of our water needs. So Button Rock serves two thirds of our water needs. Two thirds of our water. Um, I keep saying needs because I can't think of the other word because it's 630 at night. Um, <laughs> of our water demand is native basins, so served by the St. Vrain Creek, and one third of our water demand is served from the Colorado River. So as we listen to Russ talk, we can make that connection to our water at home, the water that's coming out of our sinks at home. Some of it's from the Colorado River. So make that connection, settle in, and thank you all so much for coming. That, okay, so the question was, can you reach me at that number? No, <laughs> that is the main event producer for the water fair. Um, but I'll put some cards. Uh, I don't have any cards on me. <laughs> but you can go to the Longmont website and search for my name. It's Hope Bartlett, mm -hmm. like the pair. And my number's on there. I know, yeah. I get a lot of like, hope you have a good day, and then like Bartlett pair stuff. All right, anyways, <laughs> without further ado, <laughs> Russ. Thanks. Good. Um, well, yeah, thank, thanks, uh, thanks, Hope. Thanks, Penny, for having me. The crowd here tonight. A lot. Of, um, the Colorado River District does a lot of meetings, or you know, in the spring, kind of about water, and they call it State of the River, and they get these big crowds, and I was always like. I don't know if they had a front range city did one of these. I don't know if very many people would show up, but 
here you all are. So I guess I was wrong about that. And they provide dinner, and there's not even dinner here, so, and you're all here. So, um, so it's good. So um, yeah. So thanks, thanks for having me. There's like 10 different screens in here, so I'll probably be looking in all different directions. But um, but anyway, yeah. Um, my name is Rush Schumacher. I serve as the state climatologist for Colorado, and I'm a professor of atmospheric science at CSU up in Fort Collins. Um, so yeah, we'll kind of talk about Colorado's climate and how that relates to water um, and so forth. Uh, I guess first to begin, just probably many of you may not be familiar with our office, the Colorado Climate Center, or the state climate office for Colorado, um, but we're not a state government agency, we're at university. Um, if you go back before the 1970s, oh, is, can, you, can you hear me back there? Okay, like it sounds very loud to me up here, but I can't tell, okay, good. Um, uh, so there was actually a federal government program of state climatologists, um, but that was done away with in 1973, and then, um, our office was started later that same year, so it's actually our 50th. It was, I think, it officially maybe was 74. So I think it's our 50th year uh, this year of being at CSU. What a lot of states did at that point was set up an office at the the land grant university, the ag school, um, to to do that. So there's a picture of our, most of our team. Um, so we talk about what we do is threefold. So uh, climate monitoring. Um, so that's you know keeping track of what's going on with the snowpack in the winter or drought conditions in the, you know, whatever time of year, high impact weather, you know, any of those kinds of things. We, the, the role of the state climate office in the past was much more heavily on like archiving the data. And so we have lots of old paper records in our office, but nobody really uses those anymore because everything's digitized. Um, so that's that, but, but it's fun to go down in the basement and, and dig through those from time to time. Uh, we do some climate research on topics relevant to Colorado. So again, that's m largely drought and, and snow and water and, and weather. My expert, my like research expertise isn't more on the weather side than the climate side. So I like to look at the the heavy rainstorms and sphere storms and things like that. And then climate services. So we're here as a resource. Um, if there's data uh, you know, you're looking for and you can't find, um, you know, we, we can try to help. Uh, we do lots of presentations like this and media and, and stuff. So we're always around. If you've got a group that, that you know, who want to have a similar presentation or whatever, we, um, we do a lot of that. So we're, we're here. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out. All right, so let's kind of dive in here. Um, and we'll start with, before we get into the, the kind of water situation, just kind of take a look at, at Colorado's climate and some of the extremes uh, that we have in, in terms of weather. Um, so one is, is wildfire, of course. We all, you know, if you've been here the last few years, we, we, in 2020, 2021, um, quite familiar with that. This one is a little bit older. This is the High Park Fire. Uh, that was west of Fort Collins. I actually took that time lapse from the roof of our building um, in in 2012, uh, and then one year later, the flood, right? The the big flood um, that you know all all up and down the Front Range, um, Big Thompson Canyon is that photo. St. Vrain Creek, just you know down the block here, uh, flooding. I'm guessing I don't know how many people had flood damage here in 2013. Longmont, I know a lot of people did couple couple folks yeah so um, so we get fires we get floods um, big hailstorms this is our new that's a, a picture of our new state record hailstone that was just set this last summer storm chaser got that um, I've got a 3d print of the previous record that we can pass around if you want um, so this was this is actually a little bit smaller than that one is five and a quarter max diameter this one is 4.83 max diameter. This is a little too heavy, the, the 3D print, but the size and the shape and everything is just right. So I don't, I'll pass it or you can just pass it around. Just make sure I get it back at the end. Um, just this last summer in Yuma County, yeah, uh, kind of between Kirk and Idalia. Out in the, and this one was um, near in Bethune, near Burlington in 2019. Um, so there's a group that has a 3D scanner, and like anytime these, it's actually part, so it's affiliated with the insurance industry. Anytime these huge uh, hailstones happen, they come out and scan them because then they can use that information to, you know, figure out how to build better shingles and, and things like that. Um, tornadoes, of course. Um, you know, we don't 
get a lot of strong tornadoes, but we do get quite a lot of tornadoes. Longmont had a had the the Longmont uh, you know birthed tornado uh, 2015, right? Um, that that was a pretty one of the stronger ones that's happened in Colorado in years. Storms. That's the March 2003 storm. We obviously had a one not quite that big just last month, but pretty big one. Um, and more fire. That uh, was another another fire picture from from 2020. So kind of get you know we run the gamut here in in Colorado. Um, and then we, let's kind of take a look at at what makes up the climate of our state. Um, so this is not a climate map, but it's it, it's extremely important for our climate. Uh, this is a map of the topography of Colorado, uh, colored on a scale based on the state flag that I think looks kind of nice. Um, and so you can see the, you know, we all know this, right? You've been around, you know the how varied the, the topography is here um, in our state. And so we have, of course, the mountain ranges, the various mountain ranges, the valleys, um, and but even interesting variations here uh, east of the divide, the Cheyenne Ridge to the north, the Palmer Divide to the south, and then the river valleys in between. Um, so that's important for weather and climate as well. Um, and and you know so so you can kind of see this in terms of the terrain, and then if we flip to a similar map that's the annual average precipitation, uh, you see that they're you know they they're not perfectly lined up, but but very you know a lot of similarities, right? So um, and we range everything from uh, parts of the San Luis Valley in the south that only get like seven or eight inches of of liquid uh, precipitation per year. Uh, all the way up to like the park range in the north um, of like more than 50 inches a year on average, which is, you know, from hundreds of inches of snow uh, and a little bit of everything in between, right? So you can see the valleys and the mountain ranges on the western slope and all the, the complex variations in there. So there's a lot of, um, you know, it's, it's a complex place. And so kind of when we get into some of these, the climate statistics later, we'll be showing like statewide averages, but keep in mind, like that's mostly just for like simplicity and for the sake of time, it's really hard to represent Colorado with averages um, because often what's happening east of the divide is different from what's happening west or, you know, north and south and or high elevations and low elevations. Um, so it's a, it's a, you know, it's a complex but a fascinating place to, to study this. This is this is one of my favorite maps. That's kind of you know looks like abstract art at first, um, but it what it shows is the 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 color shading is which month is the average wettest month, um, and uh, all 12 months are represented within Colorado, and we're the only state that has that. Uh, so you can see like here on the Northern Front Range, May is our wettest month on average. Uh, you go south in the, like Southeast Colorado tends to be June or July or July or August. Um, June up in the northeast corner, the mid uh, mid elevations in northwest Colorado is mostly April, so that aligns with the the big snowstorm that happened there earlier this week. The the highest elevations tends to be in the winter. Most of western Colorado is the fall, actually, so it's you know it's really varied wherever you go. So um, again, just kind of a reflection of the the huge variations we have around our state. Um, there's also variations in temperature, mostly related to the terrain. Maybe not quite as extreme as the precipitation variations, but uh, but they're there as well. You have everything from, you know, spots in the southeast and 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 in the valleys um, out west where it's quite warm on average, to spots like. Um, you know the highest elevations where the average temperature for the whole year is below freezing um, and and everything in between uh, you can see on the map there um, but you know we're here tonight kind of to talk about water and oh what happened to the an the animation didn't play it's supposed to be an animation but oh, maybe I can click on it we'll see may not have ah, didn't come through well anyway what it shows is um, just, I mean, I think, and, and probably most folks, folks realize this, and, and we'll get a little bit more into it as well, right, is most, is the water really all come, in large part, comes from the snowpack, right? So we build up snowpack in the winter, in the mountains. That's our natural reservoir of water um, that, that builds up every winter. Then it melts and it runs off in the spring, and that's the water supply that goes into the rivers, into the 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 reservoirs and so forth. Um, so what the animation shows if it played was the, um, 
you see the like 2011 was a very wet year, very snowy year. You see a big buildup of snowpack, and then you see very high runoff. 2012 was one of the worst drought years, uh, much less snowpack and much less runoff, and they they line up, uh, you know, not perfectly, but but pretty close. Um, and so measurements of snow are hugely important for understanding the water situation. Um, this is these are so the automated stations you can see on the left there um, are are called snow tell stations for snow telemetry. So the main in, the main measurement device there is actually this big pillow um, that weighs the snow. So it and you know how you, we we know how much water weighs, and so you essentially weighs the the snow and you can convert that into the amount of water, and then that's the, you know very informative for the water supply. Uh, but there's also still people go up and dig the snow pits and do it the the old-fashioned way as well um, in certain locations. And then and now the kind of new the newest technology is doing um, flights with lidars that that can measure at really really high detail um, what the how much snow there is in in different areas. Um, so that's that's kind of key to the water situation. Um, and so Colorado, the water comes from our mountains, the buildup of the snowpack in our mountains, um, and we're a headwater state here in Colorado. So our mountains provide water not just for us here in Colorado, but in all directions, rivers that flow in all directions for millions and millions of people, uh, especially the Colorado River flowing west. Um, so this map shows the the average flows leaving the state um, it, from each of the major river basins. And so you can see the, like the South Platte and the Arkansas that, that flow east are, are, have much, much less water, at least that leaves the state, than what goes into the Colorado and its big tributaries like, like the Yampa and the San Juan and the, and the White and the Green. Um, the Dolores. So, uh, but of course, the the challenge around all of this is that there's far, far more people that live east of the Continental Divide than live to the west. Um, so it's it's actually these days it's pr it's getting closer to 90-10 divide. It used to be more like 80-20, but it's more like 90% of the population is east of the Continental Divide, 10% west, because the Front Range is mostly just because the Front Range population has exploded so much. Um, but the water the flows leaving the state or the, the river flows are more like 80, like 78% going west and 22% going east. So you can see where the challenges arise here that um, the growing population here along the Front Range especially, we need water. Um, uh, but the, the agriculture in Western Colorado and the people in Western Colorado and all the other states downstream um, also want that water. And, and so, uh, and, and in, in many places, there's getting to be less of it. And so this, this raises a lot of challenges, um, as, as you all are probably familiar with, and, that, and that's why you're here tonight. Um, so, and then Hope mentioned this earlier, right? So we also then have part of the, you know, solution, if you want to call it that, part of people have decided to do over time to, to kind of account for this issue of the population being east of the divide but the water going west uh, is transbasin diversion. So you pump the water from underneath the continental divide over to um, reservoirs and, and rivers uh, on the east side. So the probably can't see all the details there, but a lot of those are, are right here on the northern front range, um, like Carter Lake, Horsetooth Reservoir, those, those reservoirs are, are full of water that originated west of the divide and is pumped under and stored in those reservoirs and then used by, um, you know, by users, agriculture, and, and people um, on, the, on the east side of the divide. All right, so we'll now kind of take a look back, just kind of take a swing through where some of the data comes from for weather and climate, just because I think this stuff's kind of interesting. So um, the systematic collection of data here in Colorado started um, in the 1870s, 1880s, mostly at like um, forts, army forts. The What we now know as the National Weather Service started as part of the Army Signal Corps. Um, and and the observers took you know took these beautiful uh, you know handwritten records of the 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 temperature the pressure if it was raining or snowing what the clouds looked like and all that so those are the those are the fun thing this is from 
Denver in some week in November of 1871. Um, so it's always fun to go back and, and look in those. Now, obviously, a lot of a lot more things are automated. Um, one of the weather stations with real interesting history is up on the top of Pikes Peak. Uh, they put a weather station up there starting in 1873. Um, and there were people living up there and taking the measurements. And there's some great, we've got a book with these like stories of people getting struck by lightning and all this stuff up there. As you imagine, that probably happens, happened quite a lot. Um, you know, but uh, so then the they sent the reports out and it got out to the you know, to the East Coast media and everything about how, um, you know, how rigorous, how, uh, you know, yeah, how challenging the climate of Colorado is. I mean, yeah, if you're on top of Pikes Peak, the climate is definitely challenging up there. I mean, we certainly have have our our uh, variations and our uh, you know our our hazards and all that, but it but Pikes Peak's probably not super representative. Um, but then you kind of build these records up over time, and and you start to form information about the climate of the state um, that it's highly variable, that we live in a semi-arid place, um, you know, especially the low elevations. We don't get, it, it, you, most of the time, we don't get as much uh, rain and snow as, as we might like. Um, so that came into focus uh, pretty quickly. And then, you know, build up the records over time and kind of figure out what, what the factors are that make our climate what it is. We've already touched on a little bit of this, right? So uh, it's a high elevation, so our, Colorado is the highest average elevation state by far. Um, we're in the mid-latitudes, right? So we're, uh, the jet stream comes down in the, in the winter and, and the fall and the spring, and we get big weather systems and huge changes from, you know, 70 degree days the other day to cold and snowy today and so forth. Um, and we're in the interior of the continent, right? So this is part of the limitation with waters. We're not close to a water source, uh, you know, an ocean. Um, so the moisture has to come from somewhere else. Uh, it, the, the water vapor that gives us our rain and snow. The topography, as we talked about, and then of course the the seasonal cycles of, that that you know that cause the or the changes in solar energy that cause the season and so forth. Um, so it's sunny in Colorado, not quite as sunny as, say, like Arizona, New Mexico. This is a map of um, average sunshine is essentially what you can think about it, like average solar radiation uh, coming in. Uh, so it's a lot sunnier here than, say, in the Midwest or the Northeast. Um, for growing things, vegetation obviously needs sun to grow, um, but, but maybe only up to a point. Uh, it's windy, um, not as windy as some other places, but like if you compare Colorado and Wyoming there, you get, there's a lot more, a lot more persistent wind in Wyoming. Um, but here along the front range, we have some spots that are extremely windy, like, you know, closer to Boulder, uh, with the downslope winds that come over the mountains and, and so forth. And the big, you know, we had the big windstorm the, the two weekends ago. Um, so we, we kind of know that. Um, we've touched on the topography as well, but that is also important for example, for growing things. This is the new, um, the plant hardiness zones. If you're a gardener, uh, you might be familiar with that. Um, and you can kind of see, so it's, which is based, it's really based on the coldest, uh, the coldest temperatures that you get in the winter. And you can see a lot of variations there, right? Like, um, you can probably kind of pick out like the, the, what's probably a bit of a reflection of the urban heat island around Denver and the, and the urban corridor. Obviously the high mountain valleys get extremely cold, but there's spots like Grand Junction, Palisade, right? You can grow peaches because it, because it doesn't get that cold in the winter there. And spots around like Canyon City, Salida as well are, are a bit like that. Year to year variations in precipitation are huge. We can go from drought to flood and, and back uh, pretty quickly. Um, conditions can change in a hurry. This was the, the big cold front that happened uh, last, well, December of 2022. I mean, you might remember that. If, if, you, if you were outside in that, you would probably remember because it was, it, I mean, it was the closest thing I think you can get to a, a you know, a step change in the temperature. Uh, this is from a weather station that takes data uh, 10, 10 times per second uh, out in Akron. 
northeast Colorado, and it was so 11 degrees in 30 seconds, 15 degrees almost in one minute uh, temperature drop up there, which is, is pretty remarkable. Um, and no two years are the same. The black line there is the, the black line, this is from Fort Collins, but it would look the same anywhere. The black line there is the average, right? That's what you expect. And then all the other ones are what actually happened in those years. So um, yeah, so that's, that's, what we, that's what we deal with. All right, so that's kind of a representation of Colorado's climate, what we know about it, what we observe. Um, we can now kind of then try to think about what, what, what is causing the climate to change and what does that mean for Colorado. Um, so these are a few slides that, that I borrowed from my colleague Scott Denning at CSU that I think kind of nicely explain the, the basic physics of, of climate change um, in a few minutes. And the, the idea is, it, you know, it, it kind of focuses around this idea of the greenhouse effect. And the, the, so all the sun for the provide, the, all the energy that we have here on the planet originates from the sun, right? So if some of that makes it down to the, to the surface. Some of it gets reflected by clouds or by snow and ice. Um, and so forth, some of it gets absorbed by the surface. And then because the surface has a temperature also, it radiates energy, not nearly as much, but it ra radiates energy upward. Some of that goes right out to space. Some of it gets absorbed by clouds, comes back down. Um, and some of it gets, gets essentially absorbed by the atmosphere itself and the gases in the atmosphere, like water vapor, like carbon dioxide. And then that radiation comes back down. And that actually is what kind of keeps the planet habitable um, in the first place. But it's changes in that, that that is kind of what is cause for concern. So we can think about this, what, what might happen on a given fall night in Colorado. Um, so imagine the, the ground temperature is about 15 Celsius or 60 Fahrenheit at 5 PM. Numbers are just kind of hypothetical here. Um, but because of that, because the, the ground has that warmth in it, it's emitting radiation upward, uh, the, the soil surfaces. So it's emitting some you know, uh, energy um, upward towards space. And, and, and it's maybe a four inch deep layer that's doing that radiating. You're not really getting radiation from, from down further below than that. Um, so if we just have this equation, if we have no uh, atmosphere, no anything else, and, and this is the only thing that we are concerned about with uh, the radiation budget, by the next morning, we're down to 78 below. Um, so that doesn't seem right. That's not, uh, we don't observe that right well. We, we wouldn't even be here to observe it if that was what, what actually happened. So we know that's not right. So what, what's actually happening then is instead, the air is absorbing some of that radiation, some of some rate that, and it, then has the temperature, it's emitting radiation back down. Um, and it's, it's, so it's trapping that, rate, that energy rather than the energy just going out to space and we get down to 78 below. It's trapping that energy. Some of it comes back down to the ground. By the next morning, we're at a relatively comfortable 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is also what we observe, right? Like we have many, many years of temperature observations. We know it doesn't get down to 80 below every night. This, this is much more reasonable. Um, and, and so that is essentially what, what keeps the planet habitable. So the strongest evidence for the greenhouse effect is that we can survive night. Uh, we wouldn't be here otherwise. Um, so we know that is, is happening. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's originally from naturally occurring gases, water vapor, CO2, et cetera. Um, the issue is, is the changes that are happening in that of having more of those gases in the atmosphere like CO2. Um, so imagine that, um, that we double the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. What would happen is that would add four, four more watts of, of energy coming down to every square meter of the Earth all the time, which is like roughly a, a, you know, some kind of light bulb that's, that's uh, four watts. If you have more energy coming down, it's going to make the surface warmer. Um, and it turns out this, this whole effect was figured out before light bulbs were even invented. Um, so it's, and um, so the, the, 
the scientist that often gets credit for kind of discovering this, figuring this out, is John Tyndall um, in the late 1850s. But but actually, Eunice Foote a few years ago, a few years before that, really figured it out, figured this out herself with her her own experiments. Um, but as you might guess, women in science were not really appreciated or or kind of allowed to to you know, present their findings and things like that at the time. So at least recently, uh, she's been getting a lot more uh, recognition for her discovery um, in, in, in this area. But in any case, they kind of figured out that, yeah, the, these gases absorb radiation, and then that, that, that feasibly could increase temperature. Then as other scientists came along, kind of figured out that, that yes, it actually is. Uh, that is actually what's happening. And so we know that it's been getting warmer recently, but this actually is not the reason why kind of we think that warming is going to continue happening. Um, that's actually not the, the reason. It's much simpler than that. It's that you know that if you, heat, if you add heat to things, they warm up. You would be very surprised if you put a pot of water on the stove and you turn the heat on and it just stayed the same temperature forever, right? Like that wouldn't happen. Same thing here. We're, heating, we're adding heat to the system, which means it's going to warm up. We can't necessarily predict every, you know, every bubble in that pot of water or exactly when the, boi you know, the boiling is going to happen, all that. There's uncertainties around that. But the basic physics is that you add heat to something, it, it warms up, and, and that's kind of what we're, what we're dealing with. OK, so what does this mean for Colorado and for our, you know, what's happening here? Um, we just released this updated. So this is, I guess, the third version, third edition of climate change in Colorado um, that we updated, got the, the new version out in January. Um, so all of it is on, the, I'll show you some graphics here, of course, but, but if you want to explore more, it's climatechange.colostate.edu is where the report is, and more maps and graphs and, and things like that. Um, so the most, re it, was, it, had, it had been 10 years since one of these reports had been updated, so, um, so it's kind of good to, to get that out there. So the way we've, and I'll talk just a bit about the report here, and then how, especially how it relates to water. So. Um, the the way we've kind of framed it is is so chapter well chapter one's an introduction chapter two is these main climate variables temperature and precipitation these are the best like the mo we have the most observations of these right we have long term observations of temperature and precipitation in a lot of places and we can look at what has happened recently like what's been observed changes if any what is expected to happen in the future and what the confidence is there so you can see for temperature. It's been getting warmer. It's projected to continue getting warmer. There's very high confidence in that, again, because we're adding heat to the system. Uh, precipitation is always more complicated. Uh, the recent trend has been downward. Um, we've had a lot more dry years than wet years within the last couple of decades. But it's not clear whether that will continue. Um, so there's kind of low confidence in what the future changes in precipitation will be. We'll get into that um, in a minute. So we can look at, at what those changes look like in terms of the observations, what's, what's already occurred. Um, this is averaged over Colorado statewide. Uh, temperature going back to the late 1800s, um, with, it's a, it basically is each year warmer or cooler than the late 20th century average. So the blue years are cooler, the red years are warmer than that. You can see there's a lot more warmer years recently than cooler years, um, a, a, pretty, a pretty clear upward trend. Uh, statewide, seven of the nine warmest years on record have been since 2012. Um, the last couple of years, not especially warm, um, but you know, 2012, 2016, 2020, um, all extreme, 2012 is, the, is still the warmest one on there, um, but yeah. And so you can you can kind of see too, right? Like uh, 1934 is the the one that goes way up back in that time period. That was during the Dust Bowl period. That was such a far outlier from anything else that had ever been observed or really observed since for a very long time. Uh, but you can see years kind of like that now are a lot more common uh, than than they were uh, back then. Uh, globally, tw so 2023 in Colorado was not especially warm, but globally it was the warmest year since records have been taken by quite a lot. The oceans have been extremely warm, um, and you can see most everywhere in red, everywhere in that darkest red on that map was record warmest, and most places were much warmer than average. The western U.S., the southwest was an exception to that, where it was a little bit closer to average. 
last year. Um, all right, and here's, so here's precipitation. This is more complicated, as I said. Uh, there's really no long-term trend in precipitation, at least if you average over the whole state. Um, these are wet years and dry years. Again, wet water years and wet and dry water years uh, with respect to the 20th century average. Um, so really what you see here is these variations year to year, um, decade to decade. You see the Dust Bowl, the 1930s in there, you know, quite dry through like the 50s and 60s, quite wet in the 80s and 90s, and then um, some very dry years since 2000, but also some wet years in there in like 2013, last year um, in there as well. What last water year was a was a relatively wet one, very wet here in, on the Front Range, um, but but wet also wet in the statewide average. Um, this is temperature changes now just kind of broken down by region. On the left is the that whole record going back to the late 1800s. The right is just since 1980, so the more recent period. Um, you can see it's it's especially western and, and southwestern Colorado that have, have generally warmed the most um, and, and have been, that warming's been accelerating. Here on the front range, the recent trend is not as steep as, as some of those other places. Um, our summers and falls have been getting a lot warmer recently, but the winters have kind of been a little bit more steady um, over that time period. But all the, you know, they've all warmed since since the, the late 1800s. And here's what it's, like I, what I was just saying, kind of broken down by season. So since the late 1800s statewide, almost three degrees Fahrenheit of warming, about 2.3 of that then since 1980. Summers and falls since 1980, big increases, um, but more muted increases in the winter and the spring. Uh, over that time period. Uh, so what's going to happen in the future? Uh, we, I won't go into all the details of, of kind of how climate models are set up. That would be a whole other thing. But um, this, is, this is showing, so what we chose to show in the report is kind of a moderate a future greenhouse gas emission scenario, which aligns pretty well with where things are right now. Um, and what you know, governments have committed to in the future. So not like a worst case, uh, uh, huge warming, but also not assuming that that um, that that emissions will be really curtailed. Those th either of those things could happen. So this is not the only possible trajectory, but it seems like the one that we're more or less on the track for. Um, so on here, the black lines are the observed temperature. That's what's happened up to up to this point, and then. The thick orange lines are two different sets of climate model projections for the future. Um, and then the like range of possibilities around that for a moderate emission scenario. Um, but you can see the, the projections are all toward more warming um, out into you know, the rest of the century um, with, with those, uh, you know, if, if we assume that, that the, the greenhouse gas emissions are not you know, suddenly curtailed. Um, this is maybe maybe a little bit easier way to see the numbers. The two bars here, CMIP five, CMIP six, those are the two different flavors of, of climate model runs, two different versions of climate model runs. But you can kind of see the middle, the median for each of those is somewhere in that four to five Fahrenheit uh, total warming by 2050. That's compared to the late 20th century. The baseline is important here. so. We've already had about a degree and a half over that particular time period. So it's another two and a half to three and a half, four degrees to expect between now and, and 30 years from now, essentially. Um, so that's quite a bit of more warming expected. Uh, precipitation, though, is also complicated and all over the place. Uh, some climate models show Colorado getting having significantly more precipitation in the future, some significantly less, a lot in the middle. Um, what could also happen is that precipitation gets a lot more variable, but the average stays the same. Uh, there would be imp uh, you know, implications of that as well. Um, but basically, that's still a big uncertainty is like, how will precipitation change um, in the future? But even if it kind of doesn't change at all and stays the same, warming is, is, is important for water and, and has important influences. So that's what we'll get into next here. This is the, some of the water-specific um, analysis. 
Uh, so there's a few different variables here that are important to water. So snowpack, timing of runoff, how much water is in the river, evaporative demand, which I'll talk more about in a second, and then soil moisture. Um, so all of these you can kind of see with varying confidence are looking worse uh, out in, in the projections. So snowpack has been declining and probably will decline, but the kind of the peak snowpack hasn't declined by all that much and the year to year variability is huge. Um, so there probably will continue to be declines in that. Um, but the, the more robust change, and this is especially true if you look west of the divide, is toward earlier run, earlier melt out of the snow, earlier runoff. Um, so even if you reach the peak, the kind of average peak that you might expect, that water that water is probably going to run off earlier in the year, um, like earlier in the spring. Um, annual stream flow, again, generally has been trending lower, but only kind of medium confidence that that will continue in the future. Um, but some of that comes on the demand side too. This is this is kind of assuming the this is related to the supply. Um, if the demand goes up, then the stream flow is going to go down no matter what, right? So that both of those are, are kind of out of balance at the moment. Um, the thing with very high confidence is the increased evaporative demand, um, basically the thirstiness of the air for water. We'll come to that in a minute. And then with the air being thirstier, it means the soil moisture gets drier um, as well. So, okay, so stream flow, we you know, mentioned that, that some of the water here in, in Longmont comes from the Colorado River. Um, this is the graph of, of the Colorado River flows at Lee's Ferry, so that's at Lake Powell, you know, on the Arizona-Utah border there. Um, and you can see the, the kind of, you know, what's been happening over the long term there. Um, you look back in like the 1920s, that's when the Colorado River Compact was negotiated. That was a period of very high flows and the, the people negotiating that compact uh, kind of ignored the evidence that that actually wasn't probably a very representative number to use. And so that's been a, an issue with water in the Colorado River Basin is, is that essentially that compact allocated more water than there actually is um, and that is, is a problem um, and, and a reason for some of the, the issues that are happening now. Uh, you can see like the 1980s there with a big, a big peak in, in um, stream flow, but since about 2000, um, the, they've had some very dry years and the average has come down quite a bit. So that orange line is the average of the 20th century, essentially in the 21st century, so far as that brown line is quite a bit lower. It's a difference of, in those averages, about two and a half million acre feet, which is a, a lot of water. Um, so it's, it's a, it, and so this, it, and at the same time, the demand for water has gone up. So it's, it's really putting that uh, situation out of balance on the, on the Colorado River, especially. Um, I'll talk just for a minute about drought, because this is a, this is something we focus on a lot in our office. And it's, um, I think it's a cause of confusion sometimes, and it's worth, just kind of because it's it's really it's an interesting topic and a complicated topic and it and it's important for for water resources of course I think probably if you like ask people what you know what what they picture when they picture drought it's probably this just I don't know the, in the media or like a science textbook that's probably what they would show would be a cracked uh, cracked soil and that certainly is one uh, impact of drought. Um, you might also think of, of crops that are not doing well. This is a picture I took out in, in a, two summers ago in northeast Colorado of the corn crop that was just kind of shriveled up and, and, and left and abandoned. Um, water supply is the other you know, big factor here. That's a picture from Brad Udall of, of Lake Powell. Um, that's the boat ramp there, but you can't you can't even you can barely even see the water there so that that you used to be able to put your boat in there you, you can't anymore um because of that decline you might think of something like the dust bowl pictures from the 1930s um or wildfires all of these are all of these are potential impacts of drought um and this is a quote we use a lot from from kelly redmond who was a a well-known scientists in this field that, that as with rainbows, each person experiences their own drought. If you're a farmer, you may experience that drought very differently than if you're a water manager or if you're a gardener or, or whatever. 
uh, or live in a fire prone area. So, it, so kind of scientifically, we break this down in a few different we put names on that, I guess. So meteorological drought might be what you think of. Um, and that's basically just it's not raining enough. Uh, you get dry weather patterns that set in um, or not snowing enough. Uh, hydrological drought then is when, when the water supply gets low. Um, so that's one impact. That tends to be a longer term thing, right? Like you don't, if it doesn't rain for a month, the reservoirs don't all dry up, right? So you still have that storage. But if it's dry for 20 years, then that's where those, you know, those problems come in. Uh, agricultural drought, difficulty growing food um, and, and things like that. Uh, socioeconomic drought, then you can start to think about all these other effects of if you can't navigate a river because it's too low, that has all these you know, effects on, on, on the economy uh, and so forth. And ecological drought where natural ecosystems are affected. So these are all um, different flavors of, of drought that we, that we try to contend with and try to understand. And, and, some, and you may have one of these scenarios may be very bad at a particular time and none of the others are in place where you know like on the Colorado River Basin the last couple of winters have been very snowy so from the kind of short-term perspective the situation is generally fine um, but that doesn't make up for for two decades of of low precipitation you need a lot more than that to to kind of make those up so the, those are some of the things you contend with and and this illustrates that maybe um, in a sense so these are graphs showing the levels of three different reservoirs. Uh, the two biggest in Colorado are on the top, Lake Granby and the kind of headwaters of the Colorado River. Is that, does the, does the CBT water for Longmont come, probably originates in Granby, right? Probably, yeah. Um, so that's water that comes under the Continental Divide. Blue Mesa is on the Gunnison River, not too far from Gunnison. Um, this year is the black line there. The kind of history is the, the green is the green band is the average. The blues are the very high years. The browns are very low. So we had huge snowpack last winter. Both of those reservoirs got full or close to full. They're still running with above average storage. Um, so for us here in Colorado, if we're just worried about Colorado, um, situation looks pretty good, you know, coming up, there's a lot stored in the bank. If we have a dry year, be able to mitigate that. Um, but then you look at Powell, or if you look at Lake Mead is, is a similar looking graph. Um, the big snow year last year did get it out of the historically low, uh, conditions that it was in previously, just back into like really bad, you know, so like from historically awful to really bad. So it's an improvement, but, but you need a lot more than one year for that huge reservoir to recover. Whereas in Colorado, it really does go, you know, one or two years at a time can, can make all the difference in, in either a good, a good way or a bad way. Um, okay, so evaporative demand, I referred to that. This is the idea that the atmosphere, uh, that the air, the warmer the air gets, the thirstier that air is for water. If you garden or you farm, you've probably experienced this, right? Like you have to irrigate more when it gets hot. Also, if the humidity is low, if it's windy. Um, so, so this is where, where climate change really comes into the water situation because if you warm up the atmosphere, even if the input of water is similar, the warmer air is going to want to pull more water out of the soils, the forests, the croplands, the, the reservoirs, you name it. Um, and we can illustrate this for Colorado here with two more graphs that look kind of like this. This is pretty similar to one I showed earlier. This is basically showing long-term wet and dry periods across the state in terms of precipitation. Um, so you, again, you can pick out those big drought periods like the 1930s or the ones we've had recently in the 21st century or the wet periods in the 80s and 90s. Um, so this, you can kind of think of this as the natural fluctuations in, in precipitation. We get wet periods and dry periods and that, uh, and that will always be a part of our, of our climate. But we'll add, what we'll do now is kind of add in the effects of of temperature on that evaporative demand. Um, and what we'll see is the graph actually changes quite a bit, especially on the right hand side the more recent years. So this is precipitation only. This is when you include the effects of changing temperature. And so what happens is, so yeah, if you flip back and forth, it's a big change since 2000. So this, it's the idea of hot drought um, that, that, that kind of has, has come into to use that when you have periods where you don't get a lot of rain, 
when it's hotter, that makes it worse. Then when you have the wet periods, when it's hotter, that water doesn't go as far. So the wet periods aren't as, as bountiful. And then when you get a naturally occurring drought, it's worse. Um, so this is where you know climate change is having this effect where um, you know it doesn't it's not like we didn't have droughts before or anything like that but it's just kind of tilting the odds toward them happening more often uh, and when they happen they get worse and so you and this this graph actually if you look at this graph like here on the northern front range it actually doesn't look quite so bad as this if you look at it in like southwestern Colorado it looks a whole lot worse where it's just like 20 years of, of, of dry and getting drier so um, so there's those variations as well, but that's a, that's an important factor. And then the timing is is the other kind of key thing. This is for the Colorado River out like close to Grand Junction. This would look different, I think, for the water the rivers going east, but the Colorado is where most of the water is. Um, this is stream flow and future projections. So the black line is the current stream flow pattern that we get when the snow melts out, out in the spring. So you have base flow like through the fall and the winter, um, and then the snow starts to melt in the spring and early summer, and you get the huge pulse of, of stream flow in the, in, the, in the Colorado and any of the rivers that, that are snowpack fed, right? And so it peaks maybe in June, um, and, then it, and then it comes down through the summer you maybe get some additional water from rainstorms, and then it comes down to base flow in the fall. Um, all those blue lines that are maybe hard to see, but you can just focus on the average one, which is the thick blue line, are, are different future climate projections. Um, and so you can see some of them actually, there are projections that show the peak stream flow getting higher on the Colorado River in the future. There's more of them that show it getting lower, but there's a lot of uncertainty around that. Um, but what they, every single one of them says is that the stream flow peak is going to shift earlier. Um, so what you would see is increases in stream flow in like April and May, because you get the snow to melt out sooner. Um, so the stream flow goes up in April and May, but then big declines in the, in the summer, like July, August, um, big reductions in stream flow. And this is from, you know, if you think of this from the perspective of agriculture, this is definitely not what you want to see um, because when do you need the water for irrigation? You don't need it in April and May. It's still relatively cool, you know, relatively. There's probably still a lot of moisture in the soil from, from snow over the winter. You really need the water to be available in July and August. Um, but so now if it's, if, even if it's the same amount of water, if it's coming in April and May instead of, or you know, May and June instead of July and August, um, then, then you have to make different management decisions, right? Like if, if you don't have the water available at the time that it used to be available. So, um, so this is a, a big issue as well um, when, it, when it comes to water. Um, I'll put this up here. I'm not, I don't have time to go through all of these, but if you are interested, you can kind of take a look in the report um, in terms of hazards and extremes. Uh, so the ones with the most confidence are the ones that are more directly related to temperature. So, um, you know, more intense heat waves, some reduction in cold waves, but that's not quite as, as robust, uh, more frequent intense droughts, which increases the wildfire th threat, as we've talked about, probably increases in extreme precipitation, but that's complicated here because we're not, the, the, that's a very high confidence thing if you were in the Gulf Coast or the Midwest, a uh, little less confidence here, far away from the moisture sources. So there may be increased risk there. Other things are uncertain in terms of changes like windstorms, thunderstorms, snowstorms, uh, et cetera. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can kind of take a look. I'm going to skip through these just uh, for the sake of time. Um, but kind of key to all this, right? So what we've assumed in this report is that orange line there, um, the, the 4.5 kind of middle of the road future emissions. But that is not the only future possibility, right? There are, there's a wide range of possibilities. We could go back to a much more fossil fuel intensive energy mix, and that would put us more on track of those, those ones with more warming. Uh, there could be big reductions in greenhouse gas emissions that brings back down towards those blue lines. Um, so none of this is locked in, and it's kind of you know, whatever we all collectively decide to do as a society that, that will, uh, you know, will determine that in the future. And, and that's the biggest uncertainty really of all is we can kind of say, well, this is, it looks like the track we're on and this is what would happen. Um, but there's other possible trajectories in there. 
Um, all right, so we'll kind of wrap up with, with this in terms of, of what climate change means for Colorado. Um, so we've seen warming across all seasons, an increased trend since about 1980 in most of the state. Um, no long-term trends in precipitation. The last 20 years have been dry. Um, downward trend in, in peak snowpack, although that is not as robust as the trend towards uh, earlier meltout, again, especially to the west and south. Um, Long-term warming expected to continue with high confidence. Unclear what's going to happen with precipitation, but that still means water change. This idea of hot drought is becoming more of an issue and will become more of an issue uh, because of, you get increase, that increased evaporative demand. That is bad for vegetation, forests, and so forth. Um, and in turn, that can increase. If you have more fires, that actually increases the flood risk on those burn scars, as, as we're kind of familiar with around here. Um, Harder to make a fingerprint on some of the other hazards like hailstorms and things like that. Um, so what would what might the climate look like in 2050, 30 years, 30, well, 25 years from now? Um, so in a lot of ways, it's still going to be recognizable as the climate of Colorado, right? Like um, there's going to be changes, but most winters are still going to get a lot of snow in the mountains. It might not be as much as happened in the past, but we're not. In Colorado, we're not in danger of going to snow, snow free winters anytime soon, uh, whereas that is very much a reality in California and in the Northeast. Um, summers will have warm days, hot days, uh, relatively cool nights. They might be warmer than they were in the past, um, but not the like 85 degree low temperatures that you might see in, in some other places. Highly variable precipitation from year to year. Problems with all the things we already know we have problems with, like droughts and floods and water availability and so forth. Um, but the snowpack will, on average, melt earlier in the spring. Um, more frequent hot weather, somewhat less frequent cold. Um, when droughts happen, they'll be worse. And that increases the, the wildfire threat. And destructive fires are likely going to become more frequent. Both, both climate change is a piece of that, but also we have more structures in vulnerable areas, as we are very familiar with here on the Front Range. Um, and then not clear on some of those other hazards as well. So that's maybe a picture of what, what we're looking at. OK, so just to wrap up here, one way that you could get involved if you're interested. Are there any Kokoraz observers in the? in the crowd all right can we can maybe we can rec recruit a couple of you tonight or maybe more than a couple of you um so this is Kokoraz is the community collaborative rain hail and snow network it was founded uh in 1998 after a big flood we had in fort collins uh by my predecessor nolan duskin in this position and the idea is you get a plastic rain gauge that looks like that it costs about forty dollars uh, and you put it in your backyard or your farm field or whatever, wherever, your school, wherever it's convenient, your library. Um, and you measure how much rain fell each day. And you report it uh, through on the website or the app, or you can even make a phone call. Um, and so this has been a hugely uh, successful thing. Uh, we always need more data uh, because we know precipitation varies a ton from place to place. Um, so there, the website's there, coveraz.org. Right, was born after our 97 flood. Um, and you can, this is, I don't know if the vi eh, video may not work there. But, but that shows nationally where the, oh yeah, there we go. We'll zoom in there. That shows nationally all the observers. These are all just people with rain gauges in their backyards. And you zoom in, and then you can see that zooms in on Fort Collins. You can see all the observers we have there. OK, so I'll stop there. There's my, my email, our Climate Center website. You can subscribe to our monthly summaries if you're interested, or even our blog if you're really interested. I went a little bit long. Oh, there's some Kokoraz brochures here if you want to grab one if you're interested in joining. I went a little longer than I intended, but I'm happy to stay and take questions as long as people have questions. Uh, so thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, oh, thanks. I, thank you, Russ. Yeah. And I just uh, forgot to mention in uh, my opening that Longmont Public Media did turn on the camera, so this will be on their YouTube channel, I believe, as of tomorrow. So if you have anybody you want to um, share, share the presentation with, you can do that. And I've got a mic just in case we can't hear any questions. A couple over here. I'll come grab you guys first. <laughs> I can talk. Um, is all this in a report or something like that that we can get through to you? 
Yep, so that, yeah, that climatechange.colostate.edu website is, so our main website is climate.colostate.edu, but the report is climatechange.colostate.edu. Yep, so all, all that's there, even more like maps and, and graphs and things too. If you didn't get enough of my maps and graphs tonight, there's even more in there. <laughs> yeah. Are you doing research on how to Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the question was about um, how to limit evapor evaporation from, I assume you're thinking of reservoirs, and yeah. Um, so yeah, there are, it's not really my research area, but there are people thinking about how to do this. I mean, there's a lot of creative ideas out there in terms of, you know, you could put you could put solar panels on a barge out in the reservoir, and then you're you're doing two good things at once, right? Like you're limiting the evaporation um, and getting solar energy. But like, how do you do that at scale? Is the like at the scale of these reservoirs is the hard question. So that's the that's the tough part. Is like, I mean, we could all say, well, it's yeah, easy. You just you just put a big tarp over all of it, and then you limit the evaporation. But that'd be a really really big tarp, right? So um, so that's the challenge is kind of coming up with Solutions that work, that 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 do the, that kind of accomplish the goal, but are not so expensive or not so unrealistic. Um, but there, but especially on like smaller reservoirs and things like that, like people are doing that sort of thing where where you it is more manageable to to put some sort of cover that li limits evaporation, and then maybe if you can get some energy or you can get something else out of it. Um, that the like in in. Um, Another kind of big thing, not for the reservoirs, but for croplands, is what they call agrivoltaics. It's the same idea. Basically, you build a solar panel that shades the, for some part of the day, shades the, the crops and limits some of the evaporation. And then you're also producing solar power. Um, so for some types of crops, that can actually be like they don't actually want so much sun. And then you don't evaporate so much water. And that can be useful. So there's like CSU's facility out on the Western Slopes experimenting with that quite a bit. I know. I mean, I know there's there's farmers that are that are trying that too. So there's yeah, there's a lot of good creative ideas out there. It's just a matter of how do we get it to to the scale that it, that it needs to be at. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, great question. And and I you do you want to answer it, Hope? I mean you can answer it kind of specifically. So yeah, I mean that's right. Those are Though they're, you're right, they're small. So the question was about kind of individual things for water conservation, and you're right, like one person, one one house doing that doesn't make all that much difference, but it, it adds up if, if lots of people are. And do you want to talk more about like what the Longmont programs are or, or yeah. <laughs> um, yes, you can get more information from me. And I can, uh, I'll talk to you before you leave and I'll give you my email address. Okay. Um, but yeah, so for large properties like HOAs, we do have a program through the city. It's through the neighborhood resources group. Um, so you have to be a part of the neighborhood group leaders association, which is a great group to be a part of anyways. But then that opens um, the door for you all to be eligible for grants to do landscape Thank you.
<laughs> um, I, I, do, I do as many of these as I possibly can. I'm happy to come to the HOA. I'm happy to do the HOA. Um, I'm happy to do any type of neighborhood community group. Um, follow up with me via email. We have as much as we can on our website. But it's, it's, you asked about individual action. The best individual action I like to tell people is talking to people. Just saying, No, that's great. Yeah, thanks. Is there yes. A document back here? I didn't bring printouts. No, so because we 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 actually don't even have those yet. We it's taken a while at the printer, so it's kind of we've we've got a PDF of it, but I didn't bring those. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. Oh no, no, totally. I mean, I think the I think what Hope said is exactly right is you is you you share, you talk to people about it and that's what kind of gets the the snowball, you know, accumulating and all that. I mean, it it'll it's sort of a cop out answer, but I think it 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 sort of depends on you and your situation. There's like some things that some people can afford to do and others can't. Uh, but there's but but that's kind of also the advantage of it is there's a lot of things that can be done that would, if we're thinking about like greenhouse gas emissions, that would play a role in there. Like if you can transition, if, you know, if you can do rooftop solar, like that can have a big benefit. If you can reduce your water use, that's maybe not affecting greenhouse gas emissions, but that's affecting the water situation. Like all of these things add up. So I think it's hard to put one thing because different different people will be in different scenarios that that do that. There, I mean, the the you know um, the food supply is a is a big source of greenhouse gas emissions, so that's something we have to think about as well. Um, and you know that the that's that's the other challenge on the Colorado River is that um, it's the new study just came out a week ago or so. Like I think it, I think the number is about eighty percent of the water that's used in the Colorado River is to grow um, feed for for animals. Um, so like. Is that how we want to be using our water? Like some people would say yes, some people would say no, but it's like that. We at least have to be honest about that. Is what the what the situation is. Um, so so you know I think any of these. I mean that is a yeah that I mean that's so so but all of those I mean right EVs are we're in kind of this strange state right now with like transitions of energy right is that. Um, like we're not at the point yet where we can just all do all electric everything, but that's probably the goal to shoot for because if you know if cars are electrified, homes are electrified, and then and then the energy grid gets to be all renewables, then well, not not if it's uh, I mean not if it's wind and solar and and we can do battery storage so you can actually store all that electricity. So we're obviously not there yet. Like we can't not use fossil fuels at this point but um but that's kind of the hope so I, so it's you know everybody in their situation i think has something that might apply to them like your 13 year old doesn't drive yet so telling them to get an ev probably isn't a good a good uh, a good piece of advice but it might be right it might be thinking about you know at school how how they are using energy at the school and trying to trying to you know make a difference in that way or something Right. You know, I mean, the reality is, I think that we tend to think, oh, well, that won't affect us. It's not like an immediate urgency, so how do you, like, infuse that? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that's right. Yep. Is there that yeah. I mean, I th my sense is that young people are thinking about this a lot. So, um, maybe I've got a ten-year-old, and there that's one of their things they're talking about at school and one of their projects. And so I think it's yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. 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 Yep. No, that's right, and it's yeah, it is the the it it's, it is uh, challenging there. So um, I don't think I have one in there, but but I, one way to think about it and kind of what it looks like in in a lot of these graphs is that by say by 2050, you know what we currently consider a really hot year, like a wow that was extreme that will be an average year if not a cool year you know by that point so that's that's the kind of change that we're looking at so yeah like it and it and it varies with the seasons right so another way to another way to think about this it, the the effects are especially acute in the summer of course right summer is warmer to begin with um but the difference between a warm summer and a cool summer is that much smaller than the difference between a you know, the temperature is just way more variable in the winter. So the summer is really where we already are beyond, kind of the signal is already beyond the, the noise, so to speak, in that the average summer temperature now is, is, you know, as high if not higher than like some of the very hottest summers that happened in the past. And then we look, you know, 20, 30 years out in the future, it steps up even more to what we now think is a really hot summer will not be a hot summer that will be every year you know or or worse so i don't know if that does that help at all it's yeah, I mean, I, I see what you're saying. yeah. yeah no it's true right no exactly it, it is it doesn't sound yeah it doesn't sound like that much that's exactly right i mean i think this this past winter is a really interesting example and, and kind of aligns with a lot of this in that it was, for most most places in Colorado, it was a top 10 warm winter, but we also had that week in the middle of January where it was about as cold as it ever gets here, right? And so, but but way more of the winter was, was a lot warmer than it usually is, and the average comes out that way. Um, so it was a warm winter, but that doesn't mean it won't get cold in, in the future too. Yeah. Talking about the Colorado River, um, basically roughly 80% of it goes to uh, raising bees. That's not so much the Colorado River. That's right. No, that's for like the whole basin. Yeah, it's it's not as big of a number in within Colorado. That's right. How the South Platte does go out that way because I'm I'm from the northeastern part. Yeah. And so, um, what can we do like out that direction? Because like there, there's no seminar for nothing like. Yeah. As far as like getting the community to like not be so like abusive with the water ticket, it's it's really hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, most of my friends trust me. I'm very fifty fifty with the people I grew up with, the people that still hang out with us here and whatnot. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think the I think the water the water situation is where this is sort of becoming like you know whatever what whatever you think about about climate change or or you know how bad it is or what we should do about it or whatever like that if you're if you're a farmer in northeast Colorado like you'll see it you'll you know you'll see it in how much water you need to use or or whatever those kinds of things so it's gonna you know it'll 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 show it you know how bad drought can be um even not you know naturally so 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 like it, from you know what a lot of um you know there's a lot of movement towards like the regenerative agriculture cover crops and and things like that where you can then it's both good for your soil and it's good for storing carbon in the in you know underground so there's actually a lot of places where farmers like can be the the big solution to to a lot of these things as well so in one of the pictures that you've taken out there of the crops um, of the corn that we're working for these guys that's dry line corn yep um, is like is like is that something that you can plant dry land corn 
where they plant regular corn and actually irrigate that one, but at a far less level. <laughs> That's, so there's, yeah, so there's a group in Greeley or a USDA research site where they're, yeah, it's called the Limited, limited Irrigation Research Farm. They're exploring that exact question.